Hello and welcome to lesson 30 of the Learning Guitar series. In lesson 29, uh, we started discussing the mixolydian mode and we looked at the shape of E7, so this particular shape. And of course, most of the lessons, uh, generally I transpose them in the key of G, just, you know, for consistency. And basically we looked at this particular shape, chord, in this case G7, and we looked at the scale that went with it, the arpeggios and the chords. Now we're moving on and we're looking at the shape of D7. So this is our D major chord. If I take the root note and I move it down a tone, I add the flat 7, so I get this. So this is basically a D7. We know that the guitar is a transposing instrument, and so basically I'm taking this shape, still D7, placing a barre in front of it, and now I'm starting transposing it. And that's pretty much what all there is to, you know, the shape of D7 as opposed to the D7 chord. This is a D7 chord. If I do it here, I'm still using the same shape. So it's the shape of D7. But in this case, this is G7 as a chord because this is D, E flat 7, E7, F7, F sharp 7, G7. As usual, as I said, like, I like G as a key to explain this kind of concept. So now we have two shapes, two chords that we can use to spell out a G7 chord in this case. So we had this, and this is coming from lesson 29. And now we're discussing this. Okay? And so G7 in the shape of D. The scale that goes with it is... Not surprisingly, this comes from mm, the shape of G. When we started, and by shape again, I mean this shape, so G major, I'm transposing it. In this case, it becomes a C major. And it should not be a surprise that the C Ionian scale and the G Mixolydian scale are actually, fingering wise, this is actually the same thing. Because G is the core number five for C. If this is not, if this sounds like new to you, you might want to look at the lesson 16, where I discuss a little bit, at least a level one of, the, of uh, harmony and theory. Uh, as usual, this lesson comes with, the, with, the, with a couple of PDFs where I'm detailing most of the stuff I'm talking about. So like, you know, if somehow, you know, you don't understand just by looking at it, which, you know, would not surprise me, but you can always refer to the, to the, to the PDFs. So for example, what I'm discussing right now is the fact that G7 makes Solidian so the notes I just played, is the same as C Ionian, okay? And because of that, basically in terms of exercising, we can um, look of all those exercises we had done in lesson 13, when we studied the shape of G major, G Ionian. In fact, it was up here because I was doing G as in G in the shape of E, G in the shape of D, G in the shape of C, G in the shape of A, and then G in the shape of uh, G, right? And this was the scale that we started. Now we're just doing it here, exactly the same thing. Right? Because this is D7, which is the same as G7, C major. So we like doing G7, C major. So all the all the studies we have done in terms of intervals, intervals of seconds, thirds, fourths, all the stuff they've done in lesson thirteen, again it comes handy because we don't have to add more practice to this scale. We can just keep doing that particular practice. So like all the all these kind of exercises, which by now you should be familiar with, you know, because we've done it for the first 60, 15 lessons that I can think of. So third, fourths. Uh, sorry, I lost. So these are fourths intervals, etc., etc., etc. Group of three, group of four. You find all these exercises uh, in the free PDF that accompanies uh, lesson thirteen, and there is a lot of pages related to this, and also the three notes per strings. Um, so in this case, we're focusing uh, mainly on the arpeggios, because those obviously were, are going to be different. So when we studied this particular scale shape, 
and associated it to the shape of G. In this case, it's a C chord, because that's what my bass is. So this is C major. And we started this arpeggio. Because this is C major 7 arpeggio. We also started the triad with a C major 7, C major 9, etc., etc. Now we're not looking at, at this particular cage from the point of view of a major chord, but from the point of view of a dominant 7 chord. So now the cage arpeggio looks like this. And in fact, the arpeggio is pretty much spelling um, the dominant 7 chord, in this case, G7. Um, so when it comes to the arpeggios, as you can see uh, from the from the PDF, we have you know the triad because you know as I said before, I like to st to study arpeggios beside the cage system, which is here um, from the root, just to train uh, my ears, and I think it's a good idea to practice from the root. So you have uh, G seven, G six, add the nine, which means the triad one three five plus the nine. Um, 135 flat 7 9, 135 flat 7 9 and 11. And for the full model arpeggio, so like 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13, I'm using a combination of the first shape we studied in lesson 29, so this one, joined by the shape we're studying now. I'll show it to you on the guitar in a second. And then we have two octaves of. Um, Triad, seventh, uh, sixth, and ninth. But once again, these are like a combination of between the first and the first shape that we studied, the shape of uh, E and the shape of G. So let's look at your pages on the guitar. So this is my root note. When I think of this shape, this is where the root note is. Okay. So if you learn the, the, the notes on the third string, it really helps you. So let's say you want to play using this particular shape, you want to play, I don't know. Uh, a7. So this is an A note up here. This is becomes A7 because this is A. I don't know, uh, C. Because this is a C. B. This note here, you should know it's a D because it's the empty string. So D7. Uh, F sharp 7. F7. You know, and A flat 7. I'm going to do it in the key of G, so this is my root note, this is my third, this is my fifth, this is my flat seven. So I can practice it this way. It will be good if you tell yourself what, you know, what key you are. So basically this is B flat seven, B seven. C7, C sharp 7, D7, E flat, E. And you want to do the same backwards, so like flat 7, starting from the flat 7. So this is A, B flat, B, C, C sharp, D. And as you will see in the like you will see in the PDF, there is like a third way you can do the same kind of exercises, which is basically alternating uh, ascending and then descending, moving chromatically up the neck. So you end up with this. Then you can do it obviously, you know, backwards. So this is G F sharp. F, so this is E7 as an arpeggio. With the other nine, this is where the ninth is. And again, if you study the scale, you know, it's not, should not be difficult to identify. Um, so same, same technique. You can do it this way and then like move it chromatically. And you can do it with the other nine. Of course, there is also like the nine with the eleven.
etc etc so like you have a bunch of arpeggios like six flat seven add the nine nine and eleven if you remember from lesson 29 the equivalent would be the first octave all what we're doing now is basically we are sliding across to the neck to play the second octave so if we we're doing six or flat seven add the nine that's the only way like play moving diagonally to have two octaves uh, starting from the root, obviously. When it comes to the caged arpeggio, the caged arpeggio actually starts from the third. So it's the third, fifth, flat seven, root note, third, fifth, flat seven, root note, and then third again. So you have this. And again, the way you want the way you want to practice this is exactly the same as before. So you might want to move it chromatically. You might do up and down one time and then move up chromatically. Try and remember what you're playing in terms of key. So this is A7, for example, because that's my root note. B flat. B. And, you know, as I lighted on the PDF, you have basically these arpeggios and the exercise I just showed you, basically like playing ascending, descending, and then alternated are basically here and on the following page here. So this is the reversed version, this is the alternated version. And this is the last thing I did, which was the caged version. Group of three and group of four, all, always, uh, you know, like a very good exercise to do. Basically, you're taking the caged mm -hmm. arpeggio, in this case. You can do it this with any of the arpeggios if you want, by the way, it's just, you know, uh, be creative about it, just for the, for the purpose of, uh, showing you this kind of idea, which is not even that original. I mean, it's like playing group of three, group of four. So if this is my arpeggio, instead of performing it all the notes at once, I'm gonna play the first three notes, then the following three notes, and the following three notes, then the following three notes, and you end up with this. The same thing you can do with group of four is exactly the same kind of approach. You could do group of five, group of six notes. Four means like you're playing the first four notes and the following four notes and the following four notes, following four notes, following four notes. Four notes. And you have this kind of sound. As I said, you could do group of five, group of six, and you know, it's literally like, uh, you could even do it by, I don't want to say intervals of seconds, but like kind of reverse. So starting from the second note and going back to the first, third note going to the second, fourth note going to the third, and so forth. And you get this kind of effect, which is kind of interesting in terms of vocabulary. Don't forget, like, the way I approach things is, like, you have um, a, a letter of the alphabet, and for me, this is just a letter in the alphabet. It's like A, B, C, D. It's not really a word. The moment we start doing maybe, like, intervals, they become kind of word, and once you start soloing those words, they become sentences, and now you have something called phrasing, okay? So you might have... These are just a sequence like of intervals, fourths, thirds, mixed up into a phrase, okay? Surely if, uh, this is not a phrase, this is just basically an exercise. But basically what we're doing, we're, we're dissecting things. The same thing when it comes to the arpeggio, what I just showed you. This can be interesting if you start phrasing just with arpeggio.
I hope you understand what I mean by that. So that's why it's good to do these exercises. Of course, in the PDF, I'm highlighting, say, group of three, group of four. But find other patterns if you want. You know, this group of three reversed also was interesting. So instead of starting from the first note and playing three notes, you can start from the third note and play backwards. And you get this. And it's an interesting sound. Right? So you can expand, you can always expand. And this is like the, that, this center section I was telling you about. So instead of being the alphabet, these are the words. The alphabet is just this. The basic starting point, okay? Continuing on the, on the PDF, you'll find um, from scale to arpeggio, so basically like, like we did in the uh, lesson 29, we're trying to get our brain used to switch from a scale to the arpeggio and vice versa, so from the arpeggio to the scale. In other words, this is the scale. And say, once we are there, we switch to the arpeggio. And you just keep doing this. So you get used to the idea of playing horizontally, let's put it that way, like you have two or three notes on a string, to having only one note on a string or two notes on a string. Same thing, you can start from the arpeggio and then play the scale. You don't have to do it in the key of G. Right now I'm doing it in the key of G, but like, again, you can transpose everything. Say you wanted to do it in the key of uh, B flat. Same thing. Okay. And as we move on, um, now we have a practice from chord four, five to chord one and using, using the arpeggios so that you can really hear the chord change. And because we're starting in the key of G, and G is uh, chord number five, so C is chord number one. But, uh, again, if you understood uh, lesson 16, you can do this in any key. You find uh, the five chord and on the table that, you know, the PDF table that has, is associated with, the, with that lesson, and you can figure out what the one chord is. Nevertheless, what we're looking is at is this shape as the chord number five, in this case, G7, going to chord number one, so this. In this case, C major, okay? And we know that the arpeggio for major is this, while the arpeggio for dominant seven is this. And basically we're going back and forth in between the two. And because we're playing arpeggios, which are basically chords spelled in single notes, you can really hear the chord changing. So the exercise, basically, you can do it this way. A C major. G7. C major. And you can, you know, Do you want to take a different key? Same thing. So let's say we do it. This is C7. If we go into F. And this is F. So you would have F major. C7. And of course, again, if you want to expand, you can always do this in group of three. For example, instead of playing it vertical up and down, you can just break it into small pieces. Same thing, okay? Let's move on, because there is still, there is still more. Uh, so here instead we're practicing from Ionian to Dorian to Mixolydian. The arpeggio and the scale. So what's the point of this? Uh, so far, now we're on lesson 30, we have done Ionian, so major scales. We've done Dorian, so chord number two, and the minor scales that are associated with it. And now we're doing Mixolydian, so chord number five. 
as you understood by now, you know, we've done the five scale shapes, you know, the cage system. And you can do the same with the three notes per strings, by the way. So the finger patterns keep being the same. We're just, you know, displacing them in different places. So let me show you, let me show you what I mean. So um, if we play, say, like we did last time, we had G, and then we had G minor, then we had G7. So for G major, we play this. And we did G minor, Dorian, and we did this. And you can hear the difference of sound, right? So this is G Dorian. Now, and then we did G mix Solidian. Now we're doing the same in this new area. As we are starting D7, so we're gonna do D major, and we started this, I don't remember which lesson, to be honest. Then we're gonna do um, D minor. Sorry, G minor, this is still key G, it's the shape, okay? Sorry. <laughs> so this is G major, but in the shape of D. G minor in the shape of uh, D minor, and then G7 in the shape of D7. Sometimes I confuse my own brain with all this. So for major, we know that this is the scale that goes with it. Reason being that we know major is one, the scale is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Root note again. And if I start from the second, you know, I get this. G minor, now I have this. Because G minor and Dorian, we know is one, two, flat three, four, five, six, flat seven, and then root note. So the same scale, if before was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, now is one, two, flat three, four, five, six, flat seven. And root note. And if I continue with the scale, you and if you do it yourself, I mean, you soon realize that this is a shape you already studied, fingering wise. It's just that when you studied it, when you did shape of C, shape of C, like the shape in this case is F major, but um, the shape had this finger pattern. That's the beauty of the cage system. At the end of the day, you're learning when it comes to the major modes. So we're gonna do still Aeolian, Lydian, etc. Fingering wise, you're learning five patterns. Mm. And if you're doing the seven, three notes per string, you're learning seven patterns. But you can cover all the modes just with those, which means that you don't have to practice millions of scales. You're just practicing five or seven. So let's go back to the exercise. Then we have G7 and the scale, we, we know it is this one. Because mixolydian is one, two, three, four, five, six, flat seven. So if I take a major, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I'm literally just flattening the flat seven, that's it. And I get this. If I wanted to play just one octave, it would sound like this. This is basically major, Dorian, Mixolydian. And you can hear the difference. If I do it with the entire cage system, you end up with this. That's Ionian, Dorian, Mixolydian. And you're back to Ionian. This exercise is good for you to pick up the differences. Again, if you do it over one octave, they become really obvious. But at the same time, It's, you know, it's good to train your ears and also you start remembering where flat seven is, where major seven is, etc. etc. The same exercise we can do it within arpeggio. So for major, so in this case G major, shape of D, we started this. Okay. For Dorian, so for G minor, shape of D minor, we did this. Uh, And now for seventh, 
So G7 in the shape of D, we're studying this. If we combine it into an exercise, you end up with this. This is major seven, minor seven, dominant seven. I'm trying to do it as slowly as I possibly can with my brain, but as I say, don't worry, everything is tabbed. So even if visually right now it might, it might come across as a, you might not understand everything I'm doing visually, it's still, as I say, the PDF is a good reference for that. So, and from the point of view of scalar arpeggios, this is pretty much it. Now, we're also going to discuss uh, chords. So again, we have a shape of D7. I'll show it to you on the, on the PDF. So we have a bunch of chords. They're not too many uh, within the shape compared to the shape within in lesson 29. But anyway, like you have a shape of D7. Here is the scale. Here I highlighted in blue the chords so you can see what the chord looks like. Here it is, right? And this is basically the arpeggio, okay, that we just studied. And then there is a bunch of chords. Um, you know, some they're just like basically one, five, three, flat seven, basically the triad with the flat seven that's telling me that it's a dominant seven chord. Some they add colors, say, like in this case, for example, there is a nine. Uh, don't forget that when I put the root note, this is for reference. Basically, this is the chord you're playing. You're not playing this note. Whenever it's in a white dot, black dot, you obviously are playing it. And this means like it's a barre chord, okay? So you have a, some interesting, some interesting uh, shapes and sounds. I'll show you some of them. But, you know, starting from this, so G7, this is a very common one with a nine. Uh, also, this is kind of common with 11. This is with two thirds, one is here, one is here. So um, with a six and a nine, that's that's like a, a cool one. Um, basic one, three, flat seven, with a fifth on top. This, for example, like you have a flat seven here. That's an interesting one in terms of having flat seven. And this is a nine. This is a fifth, okay? And this is a third, so you have the first four strings. Or you can add the root to note on top. Or you can do a barre and have a third on top. These are all interesting sound, they're all in G, okay? So, and as I said, you, you got, you know, you got many, that's three, flat seven, one. It depends like with, where you're operating. That's an interesting sound, right? Three, flat seven, one or uh, 1, 11, flat 7, 3. These are all G7s. Okay. Uh, this is interesting too, as a sound, right? And this is a flat seven, nine, five, and 13. And as I said, you find, you'll find several here you can look at. You can uh, also like same way we did uh, going to, from chord number five to chord number one. And we did that with the, with the arpeggio. You can do the same with the chord. So you can think of going, say in this case, from G7, to C major. And you can start kind of variate the, the chords you're using. There is a bunch of chords that, you know, it doesn't have to be just, you know, this. I mean, say for example, this is a major seven, C major seven. So I could go from, I can go from this. This is basically like G7, C major, G7, and you know, this is amazing, amazing. No, fifth major seven, third, and another major seven. You could do it if you want the root, you know, there is one there. Sky is the limit, you know. That's C with a, with a, with a nine and a six. And then G7, 
his servant back to see. And you can write songs just, you know, just by not playing. It sounds a little bit cheesy to me, to my ears at least, right? But this doesn't sound as cheesy. Okay, still G7 to C. Uh, I prepared also some uh, backing tracks for, you know, uh, the, the advanced supporters on, pra on Patreon. Okay, uh, by the way, like I have a Patreon page, like, you know, some, a few people, not, not that many, they are, uh, I wish they were a bit more. <laughs> they are uh, helping supporting this project, you know, with uh, pledging like, you know, $3 a month, $9 a month. For those pledging $9 a month, I'm also uploading like backing tracks you can use to practice most of these things. Of course, you can practice them also without, you know, just a metronome is enough. But sometimes like it helps having a, 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 an audio reference, okay? It's a bit like when I played this chord. Heard on its own, this actually could be a major chord. The moment I play this, I can hear it's like it's a dominant seven. Same thing sometimes when you have a backing track behind, it gives even more focus to what you're playing. And uh, in a second, I'm going to show you how it works. The backing track is basically like two dominant seven chords uh, spaced a tone apart. So, and it's in 12 keys. So it's happening in any, in, in, all, in all the possible keys. Basically, the way it works is I'm going to do this in, in the key of A. Uh, it's going from A7 in the shape of E. And I'm going a tone down. So basically going from A to G. Okay. So basically I could take a7 if I was just doing shape of E and then play everything and tone down from it, okay? But the idea of the exercise instead is to play A in the shape of E and then when we go to G, we actually use the shape of D that we just learned. So basically we're going like this. So we're changing, we can use this to practice the scales that we've done so far. So uh, mixolydian in the shape of E and mixolydian in the shape of D. So you end up with this. This is A7. And this is G7. Back to A7. Same thing for the arpeggio. This is A7 in the shape of E. This is G7, which is what we just did. So these backing tracks are specifically designed for you to practice basically lesson 30 and lesson 29 combined. That's the entire idea. But all the backing tracks are, they kind of move parallel to what we're studying so that you can, you know, practice straight away what you're doing. Uh, in a kind of a more musical way. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate to you what I mean with the backing track in a second. I'll load it and play along. And you can use it to practice chords. So I suggest the backing tracks, each backing track is four minutes long. You can put it on repeat, obviously. Maybe I'm going to spend like, you know, 10, 20 seconds. I don't want to play for four minutes, and otherwise you're going to get, you're going to get bored. Uh, but, you know, maybe I'm going to spend 20, 10, 20 seconds just to show you how I would use in terms of practicing chords. And then the same thing, practicing just arpeggio, maybe 10, 20 seconds. Then practicing just scale, you know, just scale like, and then I'll do some phrasing, you know, trying to combine a bit of everything. Uh, so I'll, I'll upload the track and then I'll be back in a second.
And this is it for uh, lesson 30. I hope you enjoyed uh, the content of it. Hopefully, I mean, if anything, I hope you're going to learn something out of it. Obviously, when it comes to a video lesson like this, more likely, you know, the PDF, uh, you can always, you know, pause the video so you can, you know, uh, focus on something a little bit at a time. This is, a, you know, the amount of material that is, you're not going to learn it in one day. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a guitar. It's, you know, it's a beautiful instrument, but it's not always an easy instrument. But hopefully, like, you know, throughout so far in these 30 lessons, I'm kind of building your knowledge in a, in a logical manner. So at this stage, we're still studying scales and arpeggios and chords, because, you know, that's like, as I say, the alphabet on which we build then words and then we build, you know, phrasing. And hopefully when we get to, you know, the phrasing and uh, it's basically like you're using a dictionary, then, you know, there is a lot of stuff that you'll understand just because you understood this. So it takes a little bit of time, you know, I'm not going to hide it from you. Like, you know, I, I could teach you just one lick and probably you might, you might be even happier. But we're trying to learn the guitar. And playing licks then is going to become uh, very, very simple. Also because you're understanding them, you know, just doing something, you know, because somebody told you. Um, so this is it for lesson 30. Uh, thank you for following so far. Um, if you enjoy this, uh, this stuff I'm putting together, please feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, kind of makes me feel good with myself. <laughs> no, at least it's a sign that, you know, some people are enjoying this and appreciating this. And of course, if you want to really support it, uh, you can do this on Patreon by pledging around $3 a month, which, you know, is not, it's not much for this, if you think about it. And of course, if you want to have access to, um, all the extra material, like, you know, the backing tracks, etc. It's, I think, $9 a month or something along those lines. Um, well, I'm done, and uh, I wish you all very well. Uh, I, I hope that you're all safe. Um, and until next time, we'll see you for lesson 31.